What's going on guys? It is Bromley, we're at Empire Barbell. Real quick, I wanna talk about our mentorship program. Started in January 1st, and I've had just great feedback from the people I've had the privilege of working with so far. We still have a couple spots open. It is from scratch, you know, from the ground up personalized programming. Nothing is cookie cutter, it is made and tailored specifically for you. And you get unlimited access to me. Anytime they have a question, I am there to answer it. So make 2020 the year that you get strong, go ahead and reach out to me. I'll send you a questionnaire and we can figure out what we can do to take you to the next level. Also go ahead and check out our uh, forum, empirebarbellforum.com. We've got about 400 active members right now. It's huge. It's, it's, uh, we have a good, vibrant, uh, reliable community there that is, they're proving to be a really good training resource. We got, I keep my training log there. We got training logs. We got a members media site where, uh, People post videos looking for form checks. People post their questions about programming and diet supplementation and everything else. We've helped a lot of people there, so you know I hope to see you guys there, empirebarbellforum.com. Today, we are going to talk about peaking for a meet. Now, this is something I've covered through some of the other videos. Some of you newer guys, if you haven't come across those, you can scour down, and I've done a handful of programming videos. Today, I'm gonna to specifically talk about the peak because I'm in the middle of a peak right now, so it just seems appropriate. I'm about two weeks out, about 13 days actually from the Arnold Amateur World Strongman Championships in Columbus, Ohio. And I am getting antsy and anxious. And that is a normal thing that happens before a meet. You have all of these hopes and dreams. You have all of these doubts and fears that creep in. And it leads to a lot of sleepless, restless nights. So what is a contest peak? There's two things we're trying to do. And I'm gonna say the first one is the most important. The first role of a contest peak is so you don't screw yourself up. That's really it. The last couple of weeks of meat prep right before your contest, you're not going to get more of a training effect that's going to improve your numbers. At that point, really all you're gonna be able to do is train to be a little more sport specific and not injure yourself. That's it. Your main goal is to not injure yourself. So many people, and I've been guilty of this when I was younger, so many people let nervous energy kind of dictate what they do as they get closer to a meet and they try to cram more work into a less, you know, a smaller space and almost invariably things go sideways. You end up at the meet under recovered or worse yet, you get injured a week or two out. That's not something you wanna do. So thing number one, don't screw yourself up. Thing number two, and this is only after you execute thing number one, thing number two is to actually augment your performance by appropriately managing fatigue as you get closer to your meet. So as we get closer to the contest, everything gets very sport specific. You start to dial in whatever the specific threshold you're training in. For strongman, it can be a few things. For powerlifting, you're talking about limit strength. So it revolves heavily around, you know, a lot of singles, acclimating the heavier weight, getting your nervous system dialed in, dialing in your technique around those uh, poundages. So the way that we get that augmentation on top of getting dialed in just by practicing the sport specific stuff is by allowing enough recovery that you can actually express your physical capabilities. So throughout a training cycle, you're always going to be kind of fatigued. You know, as you chart out your training throughout a, a, an off-season training cycle, a developmental block or, or what have you, you're always going to be a little bit fati uh, fatigued. So no matter what you do in the gym, there's always a context of, it's not as much as you theoretically could do if you were completely recovered. So for a peak, <clears throat> I always start with contest day. So contest almost always on Saturday. I'm doing a pain in the ass three day show that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I compete Friday, Saturday. If I do well enough, I make it to day three. But let's just say your run of the mill meet is right here. You're on Saturday, this is contest. I always start with contest day because contest week is a screw around week. That is complete rest. Uh, usually what I prescribe is one or two days in the gym where you're doing like 60% for a few sets of five, which is nothing. It's really just a way to expend nervous energy so that people don't go in and get anxious and test their openers or do something that might actually be devastating to your recovery for the contest week. More often than not, I actually don't do anything contest week. Usually I'm involved in my weight cut. Usually I'm flying or traveling. So all that extra stress really kind of makes it easy for me to just get distracted and not do anything because at this point recovery recovery that's all you're doing at that point the hay is in the barn as they say you are really just trying to allow your body to get the surge of recovery so you actually end up peaked on contest day so contest week screw around week kick your feet up don't do anything you know focus on your weight cut if you don't have to cut weight go to the buffet eat sleep do anything you can to try and put yourself in a good state uh, come contest day so the last training day for me 
or the last training week is the week before, one week out. Now, how you structure this is gonna have a bit to do with how advanced you are. Novice lifters, newer lifters are unconditioned, which means wherever their ceiling is, their hypothetical ability to express force or to perform in some setting, an untrained lifter is not gonna be able to get very close to that. You know, coordination is gonna be an issue. Your nervous system isn't dialed in. You're not gonna be able to push as close to that threshold, which means training isn't as systemically difficult to recover from. Uh, think of it as a runner. If you're a runner, but you don't have a very efficient stride, let's say you're not very coordinated, let's say you walk with a limp. If you're running as fast as you can, it's not your actual speed that you're fighting against, it's whatever inefficiencies you have from not having a good, a good running stride or you know, whatever. It's similar in training. If you're not very efficient, your nervous system isn't dialed in, if you're not very, very dialed in to being an, an advanced lifter the way that we kind of define it, training doesn't take that much out of you, which means you can actually train heavier a bit closer to the meat. Now, I don't recommend people do that because it's not like a light bulb goes off. Hey, now you're intermediate. You know, it's not like you get an email when you become an advanced lifter. So it's better to train these tactics now because there really isn't a cost to you as a newer lifter following it the way I'm about to show you, but it will set you up to the timing of a good peak. It will get you comfortable. You know, so the psychology is a big deal. Just learning how to take your foot off the gas two weeks out, as opposed to doing this manic training as you get closer to the meet, that's very valuable. You should try to get a handle on that sooner rather than later. If you're newer, you can get away with having your last uh, heavy work, you know, the week before contest week. The most common approach, the one I use and the one that my contemporaries use, is having your last heavy week two weeks out and then having a lighter reduced effort week one week out and then going into your contest week, which is basically doing nothing. That's the taper. You see how you're aggressively going from hard to medium easy to basically nothing. So you're tapering down the workload to allow for that recovery. So everything follows a different recovery pattern. In powerlifting, it's kind of easy because it's just static strength, but the lifts you recover differently. Someone might put a squat closer to the meat where the deadlift is further out. Deadlifts are historically very difficult to recover from. Uh, whereas a bench might also be closer to the meat. In strongman, it's not just the movements, it's the threshold you're training in. You know, a deadlift for reps isn't as taxing as let's say a max effort deadlift. Uh, yoke for speed isn't as taxing as a very heavy yoke. So whatever the weight is, if, if it's for speed, if it's for endurance, if it's for reps, if it's for max weight, everything has its own different kind of recovery gradient that follows. And getting a handle on that as soon as possible, that is extremely vital. And that's where having information from uh, you know, a big training history is gonna set you up for success because you'll know. I know how long it takes me to recover from a heavy yoke. If I do the heaviest yoke I can muster and I go in seven days later and try to beat it, I'm not gonna beat it because I'm still gonna be beat up. So let's start with deads. You know, my, my peak, we'll go over what my peak is because I have farmers and yoke. They're heavy-ish, but they're for speed. So it's a 60 foot run. Uh, difficulty for the weight for both of me is medium. You know, and it's a speed run. So I'm not gonna treat these the same as if they were both like the heaviest yoke I could walk with, because those are soul crushing. Uh, the deadlift uh, is for reps, so it's on a max deadlift, but again, it's heavy. It's gonna be a 650 deadlift for reps. I'm not gonna get a ton of reps, so I tend to treat it more as kind of a max effort lift because, you know, peaking out my max deadlift, in my mind, there's a better way to take a three rep max to a five rep max than, you know, doing a bunch of reps and trying to work on muscular endurance, but that's, that's a small point. Uh, so I put deadlift as medium heavy. Uh, log is more on the light medium side. I'm gonna be getting a lot of reps on that. So that's more of an endurance event uh, because I have to clean and press each rep, which means it's how fast can I cycle through the reps? How many cleans can I do? How can I get to the end of the minute and still get a press even though I'm gassed from doing all the cleans? So that's more of an endurance event. And then God willing, I make it to day three. There is a circus dumbbell, which is kind of the same threshold as the log. It's gonna be all about how quickly I can cycle through the reps. So we got a little bit of heaviness, you know, deadlift we'll call medium heavy. The yoke and farmers are medium, log and dumbbell are kind of light medium. And we got, we'll run the full gambit of, uh, of training thresholds that we could perceivably run through. So I have an idea from training for how long it takes me to recover. So let's start with deadlift. That's the heaviest thing in my, in my opinion. So the heaviest deadlift, I usually deadlift on Tuesday. Uh, Monday or Tuesday is going to be two weeks out. It's not the week before contest week. It's the week before that. So heavy deadlift. That's the big one. That's the one that's 
I'm either gonna get to uh, the contest weight and go balls out, which I've done this already, uh, or if it's uh, you know before a meet or a max deadlift, a powerlifting meet or a max effort deadlift, I'm going to you know get as close to a one rep max as I can, or something that's gonna give me confidence for a big PR come meet day. The week after that, I'm going to go kind of a light medium deadlift. I'm gonna take it to like 80%. I'm not gonna push the envelope at all. I'm not gonna do reps close to failure. I'm not going to do anything that's that strenuous. At this point, it's just busy work. I'm initiating the taper. I'm initiating the recovery process. If I stop here because it's Tuesday, 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 and then you know four or five days till contest day, so you're looking at 18 days out, that's a little too much. So if I don't do any deadlifting, I might get a detraining effect. So that's the only reason I put this in. But this is maintenance. Maintenance is very easy. You don't do a lot for maintenance. Just a couple touches is all you need. Training to improve takes a lot of work. Training for maintenance, super easy. So don't overdo it on this day. So that gives me 14 days. So yeah, about 18 days from my last heavy day. It's about, what, 10, 10, 12 days from my last light deadlift day and then I do nothing, that works out very well for me. If I follow this, I almost invariably PR. Even if it's not an all-time PR, it'll be a PR for like the prep. You know, I've had instances where I've come back from injury and I've had to go through my full prep to kind of get back to normal. And then I'll come back in, I'll hit like, you know, the, the heaviest deadlift since my incident or what have you. But this always works out beautifully for me come contest day. I recommend you approach something very similarly. Uh, the run-up leading into that last heavy deadlift day, remember, methods are many. The principle is what, what is uh, very important, not the exact method that you use. But I'll do something like a wave, like week six, if I deload, I'll come into week seven, and I might go like 85%, and then I'll go 90% the next week, and then I'll go 95 after that. My last heavy day will be like 100%, and that's the one where I go for broke. I'll usually start, start higher volume, so I might do like five singles or doubles, and then I might go to like three singles, and then to two, and then to one single on deadlift day. And this might be, you know, I don't know, three sets of two at like 80%, something super easy. And that works out for me. It works out super well. That's how I follow my peak. Um, it's not that different for the log. I mean, for endurance stuff, I have to get closer to contest meet because, or for contest day because if I stop doing reps, you know, a full week out or uh, two weeks out, I'll be, I'll lose a step. Endurance is very easy coming, uh, easy go. So remembering that is very important because for a max deadlift, I can stop 12 days out and I'm fine. If I stop doing, uh, let's say a press for reps, 12 days out contest day, I will lose a step. So what I'll do, cause usually I do my pressing on Monday before I deadlift, I'll do my last heavy press. So let's say heavy log, just like, with my deadlift and then the week after something light medium and then the week after that i'll do a very light contest week i usually don't do anything so i might even do it on sunday but i'll do a very light rep workout that takes me into a little bit of that fatigue threshold same principle it's maintenance i'm not trying to actively hit a pr i am trying to get a feel for that threshold so i don't detrain that time but the principle of the taper is the same i start out here with a lot more substantial work and then I taper it down a little bit, and then contest week, it's next to nothing. So this, you know, kind of arrow that we create, that's what the taper is. We're tapering down our workload, and that's what accounts for recovery. So everything has a different recovery gradient, and it's important that you learn that as fast as possible. Heavy yokes, I find soul crushing. They're up there with deadlifts as far as the difficulty I have recovering from them. So I schedule it accordingly. Once it's time to go into maintenance mode and recover, it's not even about the percentage you follow, it's about how it feels, it's about the threshold you're in. So be very aware of when you're training to break records and when you're training to go into maintenance mode and recover. Also, getting a handle on this is super valuable for running your training throughout the off season and throughout the rest of the year. Once you dial in, once you go through this and you see how it works when you peak on contest day, it is mind blowing how that kind of paradigm shifts in your head and you no longer go into training just trying to murder yourself week in, week out. You'll actually start to plan kind of predictable heavy workouts around your recovery and you'll feel really good about deloading when you're supposed to deload. You'll know when it's appropriate to deload because you'll know when you started to reach that threshold of under recovery where you're gonna benefit really in a really big way from just dialing the workload back before you go in and hit a heavy attempt. So that waving back and forth, learning how to get a handle on your recovery and how to put that into your training 
is super valuable. And it's, it's what will separate you as a good lifter from everybody else who just goes in and tries to kill themselves day in, day out. So fast to get a handle on that, the better your training is gonna be long-term. And if you stack that against the next 10 years of training, you know, the, the variance and possible outcomes is gonna be massive. It's gonna be the difference between you being mediocre and broken and injured and under-recovered, or between you potentially being a world-class lifter. You know, it's that substantial. So let me know if you have any questions about this, guys. I'm sure you have a ton. The amount of different methods you could use is mind-numbingly big, right? Just remember, methods are many, principles are few. The principles are what, are what is important. So hopefully I clarified some of those for you today. Leave your questions in the comment box, or better yet, go ahead and leave it on the forum, empirebarbellforum.com. You know, I hope to see you guys there. We got a big community. You'll get a bigger discussion going if you leave it there. Um, I'll do my best to get back to these questions as soon as possible. Thanks for watching this, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. We're at Empire Barbell. I'll see you.